Cora. Laugh on restore us, oh God. Right hand. Lord, restore us, O Lord God of hosts, that we may be saved. Oh, come, let us adore.
Gracious God, we've gathered in this place this time one celebrate the fulfillment of your promise. You are a God who made us and you celebrate that together this morning. Where would any of us be without? Certainly not. You're certainly not. Certainly not redeemed by the blood of your. Certainly not loved. Thank you, God, for how. 
pray that together we be able to join. Oh, that you. Fire king. Rush. Did awesome. Did not look for it. The mountain. <laughs> From of old, no one has by the east. God. Meet him, joyfully works righteous. Those who remember you in your ways. Behold, you were angry. Been alone. Shall we all become all our righteousness looted? Y'all fade like a leaf, our iniquities like the There is no one who calls upon no one who calls upon who rouses him who have hidden her face from him, who have made your iniquity. But now, O oh Lord, you we are the clay and we are all Be not so terribly angry, O oh Lord. Remember not. I wanted to give you a. Y'all coming. Uh, some forgiveness to maybe we're the perfect maybe it's just experience Our Father, you are in heaven, and we are here on the earth. Holy is your name. Together, all of us pray, Lord, that your kingdom would come here on earth, and that your will would be done, just like it is in heaven here among us. God, today we thank you for the ways you've provided for us and have met our needs. Uh, you have been given us more than we deserve from day one. And together, all of us, God, myself included, maybe me foremost among everyone here, God, realizes that we have sinned and fallen short of your glory. That none of us do what's right 
that we all need a touch from you, a healing touch, a redeeming touch, a forgiving touch. So come and forgive us, Lord. Restore us. Rend the heavens, Lord, and come down and meet with us, we pray. Help us, God, to get our desires and our loves ordered in such a way that Christ alone is our refuge and our greatest source of joy. Forgive, Forgive us, us, O God, we pray, by the blood of your Lamb. Forgive us, God, that we would walk renewed, washed, and restored. Fill us again, Lord, with your spirit. Lord, and bring us into a relationship with each other where there's nothing between us, Lord, we pray. Help us to forgive and to be forgiven and to be one as you called us to be in your body, we ask in Christ's name. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days I have held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head. first verse again uh, so you could sing it and, and mean it this morning because God has been faithful to us and just give us one more shot at that I love you Lord let's sing this together I love you Lord oh your mercy never fails me
be seated. Luke 1, 26 through 38. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by, from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth 
to a virgin, betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age have, has also conceived a son, and, is, and this is the sixth month with her who was called with her who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Today is the first Sunday in the season of Advent. Advent means coming, and in this season we, we prepare for the coming of Christ. We light the candle on the Advent wreath to remind us of the light of abundant life and truth that Christ brings to the world. The Advent wreath includes many symbols. The wreath is a circle with no beginning and no end, which reminds us that there is no beginning or end to God or his love or care for us. The green branches represent new life. The candles symbolize um, the light of Christ shining into our world when they're lit. Um, historically, actually, even the colors of the candles have significance. The purple represents uh, prayer, sacrifice, and confession, and they remind us of our need for a savior. And then the pink or rose color represents joy. And then a little white candle there, a big white candle, but it's shorter. Um, and that we light on Christmas Eve, and that represents the purity and beauty of Jesus Christ. Today we light the first candle, the candle of hope. The prophets spoke words of hope to Israel. They talked about the promise of shalom and of a new beginning. We hope and pray for Christ's coming again and a new world with Christ's perfect reign, which will bring complete peace and harmony. Hope is like a flame that warms and comforts us. As we light this candle, we celebrate the hope of the prophets and the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. We continue to hope in God's promise that Christ will continue to fill our lives and the life of the world with love and joy and peace. Let's pray together. Thank you, God, for the flame of hope as we prepare for the celebration of Christ's coming at Christmas. Help us to remember our hope in Christ coming again and to share our hope with others. Amen. Let's sing together. Let's sing, O Come, O Come, just the first verse together. You can stay seated, that's fine. Till the sun of God. 
sing again. Rejoice. you take a moment this morning and greet each other in the name of the Lord?
Let's sing together. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. You can be seated. I'm going to invite Matt Linsky as he gets set up to come up here to the front. He's going to be uh, teaching for us this morning. But wanted to first welcome all of you uh, to this month of United Worship. Uh, the churches are going to work together to uh, celebrate this time, the season of Advent. And one of the ways we're doing that is by focusing on the theme of God being on the move. That God is on the move and that, that he's on the move toward people and that people encounter God all through scripture in very unique ways as he reveals himself to them. Oftentimes, as you may have found, when you're least expecting it or not looking for it or right in the middle uh, of a struggle. You know, when churches come together like this, there can be a tendency to think about our preferences, to think about maybe Maybe our church is not used to sitting in pews and your church isn't used to doing something our way. And sometimes what we can do as creatures of comfort is begin to mix up the priorities and the reasons for why we even came here in the first place. So I wanted just to point out this to us, that the main reason we gather here, and I know it sounds obvious, but it really is to encounter God who has been on the move toward us all week long, and for this one moment, all of us together for this time to sit back and say, Lord, what do you want from me? What do you have for me? So with that in mind, let's bow as we pray and then hear the word. Well, I want to say this too. Thank you to Carlos and to the Next Step and St. Paul's Church for uh, allowing this to take place. It's fun for us uh, to come and share together this time. So let's pray. Our gracious God, we thank you for your presence in this place. Guide us through your word. Uh, help us uh, for this month just to enjoy uh, family time together as church as we pray. And may your spirit do uh, to us and with us and through us whatever it is you have for us. We ask in Christ's name. Amen. idea that while we are on the move, God moves toward us. And in the whole course of history, God has moved toward his people in a variety of ways. God has shown himself powerfully through divine appearings. When he's made himself manifest so that 
people who are busy with life and on the move in their own way encounter God, and you know what happens when you encounter God is he has a way of redirecting your path. Can you just now, for, for all of us to feel together, can you remember the time or times in your life when God came to you, met you, and yet he turned the trajectory of your life and your path? Can you raise your hand if you've experienced that before? Like this is our story as Christians where we've met God, but not because we were pursuing him because he was looking for us. So over the course of the next weeks, we will be studying together different instances in which God made himself manifest to his people. The first one, if you have your Bibles, is in the book of Genesis, chapter 32. If you have your copy of scriptures, please turn there, Genesis chapter 32, where we'll discover a story where God moved toward one of his people named Jacob. But before we begin, I'd like to tell you a story. Do you guys like stories? Some of you do. There was a lady who lived a long time ago in a rural village, and her husband had been gone from the house for some time because he was fighting in a war. After the war was done, the husband returned home, but the wife noticed that there was something different about the husband. He was distant. He was isolated. He had a hard time talking about the experiences that he had. The wife wanted to rekindle closeness with her husband, but he just was too distant. So one day the wife went to a wise man in the village. He was trusted to be a person with great wisdom. And the wise man said, wife, if you want to fix things in your home, if you want to fix your problems, you need to get a whisker from a tiger. She was amazed by this advice. What in the world could a whisker do to my problems? Maybe it had some magical special power, she thought. So she started to concoct her scheme. At first, the wife decided to try to hunt this tiger. Surely, if I can hunt him and slay him, I can grab a whisker without any danger to myself. And so she went out with bow and arrow and spear. But this tiger was too skillful, too swift, and she could never spot him. Next, the wife said, maybe I can't hunt, but maybe I can trap this tiger. And so she set up a trap with a, a rope and tried to shackle him. And at a moment when the tiger would go through its normal journey, she tried to suddenly tighten the trap. But you see, this tiger was not only so swift, it was strong. And with a slight swipe of his claw, like a finely uh, sharpened blade, he would just shred the rope like twine. She said, maybe I need to change my strategy. And so she tried to lure in the tiger. She would set up meals at breakfast and lunch and dinner, trying to get the tiger to come close so she and her scheme could get the whisker that she so desperately needed. But once again, this tiger was too shrewd for her. He would always stand off in the distance, and only when she left would he come to get the meal. This led to the woman being filled with despair. I can't hunt, I can't trap, and I cannot lure this tiger. This tiger is untamed and powerful and shrewd. One day when she was sitting in despair, she noticed that the tiger approached her on its own terms. The first day, the tiger just watched from the horizon and peered at her. So the next day, she went to the same location. The tiger slowly got closer and closer to her each day until one day as she simply sat there and waited, the tiger got close enough where she could see the gleam in his eyes. She began to be hopeful. The next couple days, the tiger got even closer, where she could hear the pant of his breath. And then eventually, just by sitting in the same place day after day, the tiger got so close that she could pet the tiger 
on the fur. Can you imagine being this close to this kind of fierce beast? She became hopeful, but dare she not even pluck a whisker because she knew how fierce this animal was. Then eventually as this tiger came and she became familiar with it and pet the tiger day by day, the tiger on its own terms almost slightly tilted its head toward the woman, suggesting that now finally you can have one of my whiskers. And you see she plucked the whisker and there was no grimace of pain in the tiger at all. The tiger left and the woman had what she had wanted. She scurried fast back to the wise man and said, I found the thing, the answer to all of my problems. You know what the wise man did? Took the whisker and threw it in the fire and burned it. The woman said, what have you done to the only solution to my problems? The wise man said, the whisker itself has no magical power. But all that you had learned from patience and submission and waiting as you let the tiger come on its own terms, is all that you will need, the transformation that has been wrought in your own life, is all that you will need to go back to your home and to minister and care for your husband in this time of need. The wise man was the wisest of all. What does this story teach us? This story teaches us a lot about what it means to be in our life, doing things our way, in our movements, going forward on journeys and paths that we have set before us, but recognizing that there is someone who wants to meet us and come to us on his own terms. And this is the God, creator of the universe, the Savior who can forgive you of your sins, Jesus Christ. In just a few weeks, we will hear the story of Jesus coming to us. Not us coming to him, but Jesus coming to us in the form of a human, a baby, humble, born in a manger. And we will celebrate Advent, which means God comes. But before we celebrate this, we want to look in anticipation at other stories in which God had come to his people. And today, we'll look at some other instances of God coming in power and in promise and in humility. But today, we will look at this, God coming in the struggle. You see, God comes to us not when we can get our act together and make ourselves manicured and fit and trim and approach God because we somehow now are all aligned with him. You see, instead, God comes to us sometimes when we least expect it, in particular, when we're not following his ways. God is more fierce, more shrewd, and more loving than an untamed tiger. He's your creator, he's your redeemer, and he comes to you in your struggle. I hope you hear this this morning, and it fills you with hope. Because I I can bet you here that there are people in their vocations and jobs that are feeling a little bit of struggle and weight. I bet you that there are parents here who are striving to raise their kids in the discipline and instruction of the Lord, and yet it feels like a struggle sometimes to parent your kids. Can I get an amen? Is that hard? I, I bet you there are people here who are in the later phase and stage of life And you're trying to figure out your place in your family and in the world as you age. And it might feel like a struggle. Can I bring you a message of hope from Genesis 32? Simple idea is that God comes to people while they're in their struggle. He meets us in the battle. And as a season of Advent where we celebrate God's coming in Jesus... This particular story will help us remember that this is a season of anticipation and longing. We're going to meet a figure in this story named Jacob who had a lot of ambition, who had a lot of longing and desires. And he found only when he met God, only when he met God, were his deepest ambitions and desires met. We'll find in this story 
that Jacob was seeking a land of promise and blessing. And we'll discover that it was only when he encountered the living God that he found what he was looking for. That God met Jacob in his struggle and rerouted his entire life. And so, so we, we want to ask the question, a simple question this morning. How does God come to meet us? How, how does, does God, God want to come to meet you this morning? This is a beautiful month to reflect on this question. In many, many regards, regards, this question has been answered, answered because God has already come in Jesus. But we know that the historical event of Jesus' birth needs to take effect in each of our lives. And while Jesus, God has come in Jesus, God continues to come while we meet and encounter, even today, his son, Jesus Christ. So, we're going to look at Genesis chapter 32, and we're going to look at four distinct ways that God comes in the struggle. If you feel weight, if you feel burden, if you feel confusion, if you feel lost this morning, I think you can resonate with one of my favorite characters in the Bible, Jacob. And God does not wait for him to figure out all those things. Instead, he comes to him in the midst of his lostness, confusion, and even his stubbornness. Can we pray? God, I pray that you would give us wisdom as we press into your word, as we celebrate the fact that you come and you meet us when we're at our lowest and when we're at our most stubborn. And even when we feel lost and astray, you are a God who encounters personally your people. May this word give us uh, great comfort and hope, and may it lead to a transformation in each of our lives. We ask in Jesus' name, by the power of the Spirit, amen. So how does God come, and how does God want to meet us this morning? Can you guys get to Genesis 32 if you're not already there? And we're going to read this short story starting in verse 22. Jacob is one of the patriarchs of Israel. He's a really important figure, and you need to know this about him, that he was from his very birth an individual who got ahead by deceiving people. This was Jacob's skill, a master craftsman of deceit. This was not a God-honoring attribute, but it's how Jacob tried to get ahead in life. In fact, he was a twin that was born, and when he was born, he was seen grabbing the heel of his twin brother in an effort to try to get ahead. We'll see that he ended up stealing a birthright from his brother. He deceived his, his father into getting a blessing, and he even ended up outdoing his uncle Laban and getting a lot of blessing from him. This was a man who thought he knew what he wanted, and we meet him at this moment in chapter 32, verse 22. Let's listen to the story together. That same night, he arose and took, that's Jacob arose and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his 11 children, and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. It's a river. He took them and sent them across the stream and everything else that he had. And Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with Jacob until the breaking of the day. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket. And Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me go, for the day has broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. What does Israel mean? For you have striven with God and with men, and you have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But the man said, why? Is it that you ask my name? And there the man blessed Jacob. So Jacob called the name of that place 
Peniel, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been delivered. The sun rose upon him as he passed Penuel, limping because of his hip. Therefore, to this day, the people of Israel do not eat the sinew of the thigh that is on the hip socket, because the man touched the socket of Jacob's hip on the sinew of the thigh. This story, again, is one of my favorite stories. It's an episode of God coming to meet Jacob, and they have a wrestling match. And in the, co- in the course of this match, this battle, Jacob comes to incredible realizations about who God is and also a transformation in his own life. When God comes in this story, when God comes to us in our struggle, what is it that he wants to do? Number one, this is the first teaching of this passage, is that God comes as we are busy about our lives. God comes at life crossroads. God wants to meet us while we are on a journey of faith. And he doesn't wait for us to take initiative. If if there's anything we can remember about the Christmas season that should just infuse its truth in us, it's this, is that God does not wait for us to take an initiative toward him. But God takes an initiative toward us. And in this story, God meets Jacob while he's busy at work trying to preserve his life. Again, you you notice this in in the story. It says it a couple times that Jacob, in verse 32, was crossing the ford of the Jabbok. And then he, verse 23, took his wives and female servants and children and he sent them across the stream. You see, the Jabbok River was a river that was going perpendicular to the Jordan River. And Jacob was crossing this river in an effort to go back in to the promised land. And what he was traveling with was basically everything that he owned. Imagine going on a journey and losing something, but having all of your possessions back home. That was not the case for Jacob. Jacob was traveling with nearly every possession he owned. Jacob, maybe you can resonate with his story, was such a deceiver and such a liar and such a conniver that whatever he got, he could barely hold on to. As he went forward, he had to travel with it. I already told you some of the story. When Jacob was being born, he was grabbing the heel of his twin brother. When Jacob and his brother one day were having a conversation, Jacob stole the birthright from his older son Esau. Jacob, in you know, consort with his mother, deceived his aging father and stole a blessing that his older brother Esau deserved. Jacob stole it and got the blessing instead. This was such a big deal that you can imagine that Jacob and Esau had a feud and they were enemies of each other to the point where Jacob had to flee and go to his uncle in a faraway place called Haran. And when he was there, yet again, Jacob found schemes and ways to accumulate and amass his wealth. He had two wives and two female concubines. He was a wealthy and strong man, but he lived as an exile. To the point where as he lived far away in Haran, he had to actually leave. And in the point of this story, Jacob is crossing the Jabbok to come back home. But he knows who do you think he's going to have to meet. He's going to have to meet Esau. The brother that he had cheated. The brother that he had defrauded. The brother that he had lied to. And now Jacob knows, if you read the story earlier in in chapter 32, Jacob knows that Esau is coming toward him with 400 men. And they had not spoken in years. And Jacob had just stolen all of the blessing from his brother. You can imagine, it says earlier in chapter 32, that Jacob was afraid. So what Jacob started to do is to take all of his wealth and create like a parade. He sent all of these animals as offerings and presents to his brother. In fact, he sent his children and his wives and servants ahead of him. He wanted all of them to meet Esau before he met Esau. You see, Jacob, crossing the Jabbok, has confronted his dirty past. 
He's face to face with the fact that he has lied, he had schemed, he had connived. And now, as he sent all of them ahead, he's not only facing his dirty past, he's facing a fearful future. And God, in his grace, meets Jacob as he's fearful of his past and anxious of his future. I just want to ask you this morning, can you resonate with anything about Jacob's story? Has anything from your past haunted you, caused you to feel fear or anxiety? Have you ever been brought face to face with something you know that you brought upon yourself because of bad decisions in your life? Or are you looking forward to an uncertain future? Maybe it's an uncertainty of health or relationships in your family. Maybe it's an uncertainty if you know that someone has your number, they've targeted you, and they want your demise. You see, in the midst of our painful past and our fearful future, God meets us. This is precisely where God comes. In fact, we know this at the beginning of the story because it says in verse 22, that same night, this is the night, the night that Jacob was having to reckon with his past, knowing that his brother with 400 men is coming to him, and Jacob had sent all that he had, all of his possessions, literally speaking, Jacob's entire life is hanging in the balance in that present moment. And God comes to him. But God does not just come to him generically. There's two things you need to notice. You guys remember the, the, who, who is left at the, at the beginning of the story, verse 23? What does it say? Actually, verse 24. It says that Jacob was what? Say it out loud. Jacob was alone. God had allowed Jacob to do all of his schemes to the point where Jacob was the only one left on this side of the river. Because in reality, while Jacob was trying to connive and steal and manipulate his way through life, the person that Jacob really needed to reckon with is his creator God himself. And so God came to Jacob when he was alone. In fact, it's so personalized. You see Jacob's name. I'm going to give you a little bit of Hebrew right here. It's interesting. In Hebrew, Jacob is Yaakov. He came to what river? What was it called? Say it out loud. Yeah, the Jabbok. In Hebrew, it's Yabok. And the word wrestle is Yebek. It's like a play on words, right? You could say it like this. Yaakov came to Yabok and God Yabaked him. You can hear the play on words? That's like a little bit of like playing with the Hebrew, but that's kind of what it is. God is saying, okay, this is a Jacob moment. Like, I got Jacob, the deceiver, that's what his name means, right? I got him at a river where he's alone, that kind of sounds like his name, and what God, gonna, this is only like, I think two times this word appears in the, in the Old Testament of wrestle. It sounds like the name of the, of the river in Jacob's name, Yabek. Yaakov comes to Yabok, and God's going to Yabek him. Have you been there? Have you been there when even if there were people around you, it was like as if you and God were alone and you had to face your past, and you had to confront your future. And God wants to know. He wants you to know this. God does not look from his high throne in heaven at your struggle. The whole story of Christmas is that God enters into the struggle and will even struggle and wrestle with you. This is a beautiful truth of Christmas, is that God comes to us when we are at life and it's crossroads, and he addresses us in our journey of life, and he does it in a personal way. I love what G.K. Chesterton says. He says, all Christianity concentrates on the man at the crossroads or the woman at the crossroads. The, the true philosophy, the true wisdom in life is concerned with the instant, the present moment. This is what life's about. Will a person choose this road or that road? That's the only thing to think about. If you enjoy thinking. You see, what God wants to do is to get us to focus on the present moment of encounter with him in order to address the errors of our past, in order to chart a new future for us that lies ahead. I love what Exodus 20 says. 
in every place, this is God speaking, think about this. In every place where I cause my name to be remembered, what does God promise? I will come to you and bless you. God is a God who comes and meets us in our journey of life. Are you at a crossroads of vocational decisions? Is this season a crossroads of parenting confusion? Is this season a crossroads of decisions in retirement and older age? Is this for you, young people, a crossroads developmentally when you're making new decisions about your life? As you grow up, if you are at a crossroads, let God come to you. But when he comes, I want us to know the second thing. That God not only meets us as we're on the move, God meets us in a very personal way. You see, what God wants to do as he has us alone, as God meets us at our own Jabbok River, when it's just us and him, what he wants to do is he wants to confront our stubborn resistance. You see, Jacob had gotten used to doing things his own way. He wanted blessing. He schemed to get it. He wanted wealth. He connived to get it. And the reality is, is he won it because God's favor was on him. He was not blessing his deceit, but he was allowing Jacob to accumulate this wealth. But Jacob, along the way, forgot that the blessings that come from God are not the same as a relationship with the living God. And you see this in, in verse 24 and uh, through 26. It says that Jacob was left alone, and it says that a man, we don't know it's God at this moment. From, this is from Jacob's perspective. It's dark outside. The only thing that Jacob knows is that some other person met him. We'll later learn that this is a wrestling match with God. But at this point, Jacob's like, it's a man met him. And they were in a wrestling match until the break of day. So strong was Jacob, or so much God allowed Jacob to be strong, that when the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket. And J Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. You see, God meets us in our busyness of life in a very personal way. What God wants to do is confront our stubbornness. He wants to confront our deceiving ways of going about life. He wants to break us into a humility. God is not a cruel God. But encountering God is not, a, is not an event that's without sweat or pain. Hear me. God is not a cruel God. But encountering God is not a painless experience. Does that make sense? It's really important to know. Because when we meet God and he confronts the areas of our life that are, that are misaligned with his ways, it becomes a pretty painful experience. We know this, that God encountered Jacob and he wrestled with him. Jacob from his very beginning was a wrestler. He battled and struggled in the womb. He wrestled with his brother and he tried to wrangle possessions from Laban. He was a physically strong man who wrestled his entire life. And now he met his match, the living God. In fact, this was such a long fight that it was from night till dawn. You know what dawn is? This is so, it's so fascinating in the story. It repeats it, I think at least twice in the story, that this happened until the breaking of day, until dawn. Dawn is not night, and it's not day. Dawn is this, like, kind of unique mixture moment when it's kind of dark and kind of light. This is said twice in this passage for a number of reasons. One is we'll learn that God does not want to fully reveal himself to Jacob. Perhaps because if he did, Jacob would just be eviscerated, right? Like if he actually saw him in his true glory. Number two, because this breaking of day, this dawn, actually explains to us the character of Jacob and us. Aren't we, aren't we both kind of dawn-like? dawn, dawn -like? We're, we're kind of like following God, but there's night mixed in. You know what I'm saying? There's like kind of bits and pieces of light of the morning break of day. But like, I still got stuff I need rooted out of my own heart and life. You see, this struggle comes in the night 
to the point of the breaking day, revealing Jacob's character and even our own. And although, although it seems that Jacob is stronger than God, this is from Jacob kind of vantage point, he's wrestled with him. We know in the end who's the strongest because all this figure has to do is what? Touch his hip. All the power he has to just touch the hip dislocated it. You see, Jacob learns who is truly powerful. This is like, this is submission. This is removing the stubbornness. This is allowing God to show us our true weakness. We will never get the bits of night out of our hearts. We'll never move from dawn to the beauty of the morning glory day until we submit ourselves in humility to God's presence. Can you remember that day when you did that? And can I suggest to you that the season of Christmas is a season for us to remember again and again that our weakness is actually our pathway to victory. This story says that Jacob was prevailing. Jacob was winning. The reality is Jacob only fully won as he submitted in weakness to God's dislocating touch on his life. What does God want to do as he comes? God wants to come and he wants to meet us in our crossroads as we face our past and look forward to our future. But God wants to come to bring a painful but loving humility and submission into our lives. Does that make sense? God wants to come to bring, yes, a painful, but a loving, humble submission into our lives. He touched Jacob's hip. You see that Jacob, for the rest of his life, would walk with a limp. This is a great testimony. I want to ask you some questions this morning. As you are in the midst of your life right now, Maybe, you're, maybe this season of life is filled with anxiety. And if you know what anxiety is like, hear me. Anxiety can feel like a wrestling match with yourself, with others, and with God. Maybe it's not anxiety but pride. Maybe you are so self-confident in where God has you right now that you yourself are trying to chart your own way forward. Or maybe you're just trying to amass Every worldly possession that you can, greed and materialism is kind of eking its way into your heart. Can I suggest that what God wants to do to us is come and enter in the struggle, not just to wrestle for us. He actually wants to wrestle with us to show us what real prevailing and victory is, allowing God to show us our weakness, to give us a lifelong specimen that we will walk with a limp to show that we are not as strong as we actually thought we were. I love um, what Hosea chapter 6 says. Come, let us return to the Lord. For God has torn us that he may heal us. He has struck us down and he will bind us up. After two days he will revive us. On the third day he will raise us up that we may live before him. In Isaiah 30, he says a similar kind of thing, that the Lord binds up the brokenness of his people. God heals the wounds inflicted by his blow. You see, God is not an abusive God, but he will wrestle with us and put us into a submission hold that often is painful because he knows that the path of humility is the only path to escape anxiety, pride, greed materialism, or deception that's just trying to get our own way. A broken heart is what God wants to do in our lives. I want to read this quote from John Bunyan. He says, the broken heart is hard to bear, for soul pain is the sorest pain. With such a man, God has wrestled and given him a fall. And now he crouches and cringes and craves for mercy. A broken heart or a contrite spirit is a heaven-sent blessing. Covet a broken, a broken heart. heart. Prize a contrite spirit. You see, it, it is, is wounding work, of course, this breaking of the hearts. 
but without wounding, there is no saving. Conversion, therefore, is not the smooth, easygoing process some men seem to think. The, the fallow ground must be plowed and plowed and plowed. Do you ever feel like that? That God just needs, needs to keep plowing your heart? This is Jacob's story. This is the Christmas season. Men are too lofty. We tend to be too proud. We tend to be too wild and too devil, devilishly resolved in the ways of our own destruction. Nothing will hinder us from ruining our own precious and immortal souls but the breaking of their heart. God dislocating the hip of Jacob is a sign that when he comes, he meets us at the crossroads in order to humble us with a broken and a contrite heart. But let's go to the third as we're wrapping up. The third is that when God comes, he doesn't just want to give us a broken heart. He wants to rebuild us. He wants to remake us. He wants to give us a transformed life. This is why God struggles with us to begin with. So powerful is this. Let's listen to what happens. There are four instances in this story of naming. Right? The first one is, it says in verse uh, uh, 27, this man who we know turns out to be God says, what is your name? Jacob has to confess. What does he say? Say it. Jacob, which means, yeah, I'm a deceiver. Yeah, like, like that's my name. I am a heel grabber. I am one that tries to connive my way forward. So he says, okay, no longer will your name be Jacob. It will be what? Say it. Israel, because from now on, you will no longer be defined by your dirty past and no need to be fearful of your uncertain future because when you allow God to struggle with you and you submit to him in a broken heart, he now becomes a warrior God who fights for you. You hear that? When you allow God to struggle with you and submit to him in faith and humility, he now becomes a warrior God who fights for you. So Jacob, Israel, but then Jacob wants in on the game. He says what? Tell me what your name is. And I love it. Well, how does God answer? I ain't going to tell you. Because for his whole life, Jacob has been a guy who has tried to control other people. And so trying to get the name of God might be another way for Jacob to exercise his control over God. And God says, by the way, like you may think that you prevailed against me. I let the wrestling match go to the break of day. But in reality, um, no one can tame me. I'm fiercer than the tiger. I come on my own terms, in my own way. What the Bible says, celebrating the coming of Jesus, he comes at the fullness of time. When God says it's the right time, he comes. And so God remains unnamed, and yet at the end, Jacob gives a name to that place. What does he call it? Peniel, which means what? I have seen God face to face. And what does it say? My life has been delivered. You see the story switches. There's a lot more we can say here. This story switches from Jacob, it says it twice, prevailing to Jacob recognizing what he really needed was to be delivered. That needs to just soak in our hearts. Jacob used his strength to get ahead. And what he really needed was God to humble him so he could be delivered and rescued. We spend our time on the journey of life trying to gain and succeed and progress. What God wants is for us to humble and submit, allow him to be a God who struggles with us in order to bring a full life transformation. Jacob is the name of confession. Have you confessed your dirty past? Israel is the name of submission and humility. Have you yielded to God? God being unnamed is the name of faith. Do you trust him and put your life in his charge? And Peniel is the, is the name of salvation, a testimony of God's deliverance in our own life. You see, in the struggle, we recognize that the severest trials are times of choicest mercies. This is why God enters the struggle. When it gets, the, the, the dial gets turned up and it gets the hottest, is when God's deliverance and salvation comes through. I love this, po uh, this poem. It's really a hymn by William Cowper. It says, you fearful saints, fresh courage take. The clouds you so much dread are big with mercy. 
and they shall break with blessings on your head. This is the power of what God did to Jacob. It's what he did by sending his son. It's what he wants to do in our own lives. Yes, the clouds that look ominous, the sufferings and trials, the struggles and the fights and the wrestling matches that we dread. Do you know that in those clouds of suffering, there's big mercies. And they may break upon our head. But when they break upon our head, come the blessings of God. Um, so much to say, but i got to be done. I'll read it. Never mind. Isaiah 62. And you shall be called, just like Jacob, by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. And then, when he gives you a new name, you shall be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord. And a royal diadem in the hand of your God. When God gives you a new name, you now become a jewel and a gem that gives witness and testimony to his presence in the surrounding world. When God comes, he comes and meets you at the crossroads. He comes and enters into struggle to bring you to submission. He comes bringing transformation from your past to a new future. But when God comes, he comes in order to make you a testimony to the nations and the generations. There's two things that are important at the end of this story. Number one, it says in verse 31 that the sun rose upon him. The sun rose upon him as he passed Penuel, limping because of his hip. And then it gives in verse 32 this little like parenthetical thing that's like a, a dietary restriction. Well, because God touched the hip of, of Jacob, from now on, Israelites will no longer eat that section, right, of, of an animal, right? Because like it was so... Like, God touched it, right? Okay, th these are the two points, and we're done. Jacob himself becomes a living, walking testimony. Everywhere he went, he had a limp. And it reminded other people, by his name and by his gait, his walk, that God brought him into submission, and it redirected and it transformed life, his entire future. You, when you meet God and allow him to submit you in faith, do you recognize that your life, not despite of your limps, not despite of your scars, not despite of your past, but even because of those, become a living, breathing testimony to the walking, watching world. You become a gem that shines of God's goodness. But not just your testimony, this is a great tradition that's now formed. What God wants to do is to actually embed. He says, from now on, the Israelites and future generations will recognize that this is a sacred thing that happened by the touching of the hip. We're not going to eat it anymore. It affected the community. Right? It was a witness to the watching world. And if there's ever a season of tradition, it's Christmas season, isn't it? But I ask, what traditions do we have? There are no nothing wrong with family traditions. But what if our traditions this season were traditions that celebrated the coming of God? A coming that first and foremost celebrated, I met God when he came on my journey. What if this season were a season in which we celebrated the coming of God? God wrestled with me. And I've got the limp to prove it, that I submitted to him. What if the coming of God this season and the traditions we celebrated was a tradition of God meeting us and transforming us and giving us a new name? Let me tell you, the ways in which God has rerouted my future, no longer am I Jacob, but I'm Israel. I'm defined now by battle wounds with God and those trials led to blessings untold. And what if your new name became a living, breathing testimony to the watching world? The world takes its notions of God most of all from the people who say that they belong to God's family. They read us a great more, deal more than they read the Bible. They see us. They only hear about Jesus Christ. When people look and, at your life, do they notice your own Jabbok encounter with God? I pray that this season of anticipation, where we celebrate the ultimate coming of God and His Son, Jesus, will help us first begin to reflect that God comes in the struggle. God comes in the trials to do drastically more than we ever imagined. And out the back end, if we submit, we can come out not only with a new name, not only with a new life, 
but a new vocation and testimony to bear to the watching world. Can we pray? Can we stand while we pray? Let's raise our hands as a sign of worship and as a sign of submission to the God who comes in the struggle. Gracious God, thank you that you take the initiative toward us. Thank you, God, that you have wrestled and wrangled with us. And while we thought we were prevailing, what we really needed was to be delivered. Thank you, God, there's a way to escape my Jacob past and enter into a new future, a new way of living, a delivered and saved life in which we become testimonies and walking traditions to the world around us. Help this season give us comfort and joy and vision for what it means that God comes in the struggle. In Jesus' name, by the power of the Spirit, amen. Tate, can you put up the Gloria Patri slide in the end there? We thought we'd bring a little noble city uh, tradition over here to this side of the church. Uh, this song is the song we sing at the end of our services as a benediction and prayer. And I wanted to teach it to you uh, this morning. Thank you, Matt, uh, for that word from Genesis and the story of Jacob. Here's how it goes. Glory be unto the Father. Glory be unto the Son and to the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one. As it was in the beginning, so now and there shall be world without end. Amen. Let's do that again. Glory be Glory be unto the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one. As it was in the beginning, so now and there shall be, world without it. Amen, amen. We love you. Hope you have a great week. Thank you so much for joining us here this morning. I think there might be some bagels and coffee uh, over in the gym if you want. Uh, and if you came prepared to give, uh, you can find your appropriate giving boxes.